purchased lunch for the first 75 folks that came in the door. We uh, are doing something different. We've never done this before. We have, uh, we have candidates in the house, obviously. Today we have candidates for Deschutes County Commissioner, Senate District 28, and we have representatives to talk to us about the Ben Lapine School District levy and the fire department levies. These are all things uh, that, of course, directly affect us here in South Deschutes County. And so we're concentrating on those. There are, of course, uh, many other uh, questions and candidates on the, on the various ballots. We'll be back in November, hopefully doing the same sort of thing uh, with the candidates that are pertinent to that election by the time we get to the, to, uh, the November election. <laughs> so come on up, candidates, Judy. So, <laughs> you can stand behind the table, in front of, the, uh, uh, stand behind your signs. Or uh, what we are going to do is each candidate will have the opportunity for two minutes, two minutes to tell you everything about them and why you should vote for them. So please, that's not an awfully long time. They are fairly practiced at it but that you will have an opportunity to ask them questions. This is their opportunity to take that two minutes and tell them everything they feel they can in two minutes about themselves and why they're running. And then we have uh, a question for the candidates, and then we're going to be taking questions from you here in attendance, so be thinking about what that might be. Try to keep it pertinent to South County, pertinent to, of course, something that, that can be done by Deschutes County Commissioners and by uh, State Senators. Obviously, there's not much we can do about, you know, the Supreme Court and things like that. So don't ask that question. <laughs> keep, it, uh, see, keep it South County centric, if you would. Are we ready to get started? I think, uh, yeah, let's do it. Let's, We've got them lined up here. We have our uh, candidates for county commissioner. We have uh, Judy Trigo. We have incumbent Phil Chang. We have Brian Hunterer, and we have Rob Inhoff. So we'll uh, we'll just start here with Judy, and we got we got noise happening over here. So okay, I'll talk really loud. See, I can do that. You guys, I'm not going to go on and on for two minutes and tell you about 30 years worth of work I've done here, but here is a um, pamphlet about my work in the community over the last 30 years. Behind that is a letter from the sheriff, and behind that is a letter from Samuel Facey, who dropped out of the race early on. He lives in Lapine. He was 25. I said, Samuel, no, stay in. We need young people running. He said, no, no, I'm going to drop out. There's too much going on. So if you want information about me and my work in the community, it's on this page. I have a long history in Lapine. I worked with Christy Otney, who was uh, working to help incorporate, started the Newberry Eagle way back in the day. So I do have a history here. I worked for a congressman, and part of this district was Lapine. And I worked for Senator Whitson, who's uh, part of the district was in Lapine. So I spent quite a bit of time down here. What makes me unique to run for county commissioner, and I love Phil Chang, he's a great guy. We get along great, we serve on the budget committee together. Um, I disagree with some of the policy choices the county commissioners have made, and that's why I'm running, not necessarily Phil. But what makes me unique is that some have government experience, some have business experience, but I have government, business, and community experience. So that's what makes me uniquely qualified for this position. And it's great seeing you all. And if you have questions for me after, or you need a yard sign, because I did not bring them in, let me know and I will get you one. Thanks. Thank you, Judy. All right. Commissioner Chang. Hello everyone, I'm Phil Cheng. Uh, it has been my honor for the last three years to serve as your county commissioner, working on issues like community wildfire protection, housing, mental health care, and other key issues for our community and for South County. 
So I'm a pragmatic problem solver. I work with the Central Oregon Builders Association to create a missing middle uh, grant program to build more workforce housing. I got the county behind the Measure 110 reform package proposed by the district attorneys, police chiefs, sheriffs, and cities of Oregon, which just passed in the legislature. Um, I got paved pathways that will someday connect La Pine to Sun River to Bend into the county transportation system plan. None of these things would have gotten to a two-vote majority on the Board of Commissioners without me. Uh, that is why the Independent Party of Oregon, the Deschutes Democrats, and many prominent local Republicans have endorsed me in this race. In the last two forums, my opponents have questioned how well I am representing uh, the people of Deschutes County. So let's talk about how well they're uh, representing their constituents. I'll start with Judy. Judy is currently the executive director of the Sisters Chamber of Commerce, but Sisters Businesses are forming a new Sisters Business Association right now to do the job of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, in addition, the Sister City Council just withdrew uh, tourism promotion funding from the Chamber because the work wasn't getting done. So, um, on to Rob. Rob's two most well-known endorsers in the voters' camp are Crook County residents, as is his campaign manager. So, my question is, why aren't those Deschutes County residents that are endorsing you and uh, managing your campaign? Ten seconds. I will work for the people of Deschutes County and get you real results. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm moving. We we are allowed. And let's uh, let's just allow the candidates to have their two minutes, and then we'll have questions. Mr. Hunter. Hi, thank you so much for allowing me to be at this forum. I want to let you know that I'm a long time Chiefs County resident. I've also lived in Pine, I've heard it time. I have kids, I have grandkids, I have a lot of family that have thrived in Deschutes County. And Deschutes County has always offered a great deal of opportunity. And I intend to represent the people of Deschutes County, including the Pine, and I will vow to listen to what your needs are. I'm a nonpartisan candidate, and so I don't really have any special interest groups that, I, that I'm trying to get back from. I will never put myself in a position that I have to recuse myself from a vote in as a commissioner. There are three commissioners in this county, and I feel that three is enough. If you recuse yourself from being able to vote, what you've done is you've eliminated one-third of the voting population in that recusal. Now, I'm in favor of helping homeless people, but I think that also needs to be redefined. Defining by what is their need, what is what abilities do they have? But I also think that it needs to be be made temporary. It also needs to be a situation where they are willing to help themselves out of those situations. And then we don't have to get into situations that affect public safety, such as China had and Dirt World. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. And last, uh, but certainly not least, it, in the, uh, uh, the, and certainly the tallest, yes, Deschutes County Commissioner race, um, Mr. Rob Inlaw. Thank you. Um, I want to first note that I understand that what makes the mind unique is rugged individualism. And 
it's actually what makes Oregonians unique, and it's been lost in our political process. So I just want to start with that part. Now I'm introduce myself. My name is Rob Imhoff. I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a grandfather, and I'm a business owner. I'm a lifelong Oregonian, and I've raised my boys here. I'm watching my grandkids be raised here in Sioux County. And for me, it's about leaving and living a legacy. And I know that that should resonate with a lot of us in here. That's what's being lost is our ability to, to leave and live a legacy. Uh, some of the, the uh, things that were said about me, I, although I appreciate it, um, are not correct, but that's fine. I'm not going to use this time to correct those. Um, you can do your own research. What I'll tell you is that um, the, the old story of throw more money at it, it'll fix the problem, that doesn't work. We've seen it fail time and time again, and we can look at all kinds of different examples of that in our government. Personally, I think I would echo your guys' sentiments that we're tired of footing the bill for other people's mistakes. It's time to get honest and aggressive to determine where our hard-earned dollars are being spent. We need solutions, accountability, and, and can't just keep papering over cracks. We need to actually fix the problems at the root foundational level. Passion and drive are heartbeats of effective leadership. I will bring both of those to the table in abundance. My commitment is unwavering to our community's well-being and the future to Shutes County that our kids and grandkids will inherit. It's what truly fuels me each and every day. I'm ready to prove this during my campaign and my time serving as your commissioner. With my experience running a small business, in the housing industry specifically, it has given me a unique perspective and understanding of the intricacies of the housing process. From navigating regulations to fostering strategic relationships and partnerships, I've honed the skills necessary to drive real change and innovation in our housing policy. Together, please join me and let's bring in a new era of proactive leadership that is characterized by integrity, honesty, joy, resilience, and a relentless pursuit of progress. I'm ready to be that advocate and voice that works to represent each and every resident in our county. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to move down the down the road to, and that was your three, or excuse me, four candidates for Deschutes County Commissioner. And uh, now we will move into the State Senate, Senate District 28, uh, with Diane Lithicum. Well, it's great to be with you here today. So Senate District 28, if you're unfamiliar, um, even after redistricting a couple of years ago, we got reduced in our territory, but it is um, Southern Deschutes, which is why we're here in Lapine and then up the eastern edge by the Bend Airport, so it takes in those properties um, out to Alfalfa, and then all of Klamath County, and then all the way over to Jackson County, it takes in the eastern section of Jackson County and to the north. So it's, it's a large geographic area, not as large as it used to be when uh, State Senator Dennis Limpagon, my husband, first started eight years ago, it in all, included all of Crook County and all of Lake County, so at that time we had five counties that were very large and, and uh, took a long time to get around the district, but we enjoyed it. So my name is Diane Lymphicum and I am running for state senate for this district. My husband Dennis, our current state senator, and I have lived on our Klamath County ranch for 30 years, raising cattle, horses, and our kids. And um, to give you a little background, I started my career in banking and accounting and I transitioned to homeschooling mom, which was before homeschooling became as mainstream as it got during the COVID thing. This was, this was 40 years ago, amazingly enough. So um, while, while homeschooling the kids on our working cattle ranch, we also owned a number of small businesses. So my background is, is pretty much small business ownership, entrepreneurship. We owned a um, computer consulting firm that I was the office manager for and um, also an espresso stand coffee house. And I also um, took on a licensed commercial kitchen business, which was fun to own and operate. So for the past eight years, I have been chief of staff for Senator Linthicum for Senate District 28, and I have traveled the district extensively. In the legislative session, I have done um, a lot of policy work. I managed the entire office in terms of the policy staff, the analyst, the legislative aides, and uh, the interns. Ten seconds. Holy cow. So, <laughs> so, uh, so I have extensive experience in Senate District 28, and I look forward to serving you as your next 
state senator, and I, I think I'm well equipped to do the job, and I'm ready to get in there and fight for our rural Oregon values. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> Uh, two minutes seems like such a long time until you're there, right? <laughs> and they will have uh, other opportunity later on. They're doing a great job of keeping in our time frame. So, uh, Mr. Hensley, Dave Hensley. Well, let me start by saying good morning and thank you everybody for coming today to learn more about the candidates. Keep in mind that this Senate District 28 seat is your seat, not my seat, not Diane's seat. And you have an opportunity to select somebody that's going to represent you your values and your belief system in Salem, and I'm looking forward to doing that for you. We do have cards, please take one. It talks a lot about who I am and my resume and what I stand for so you can do um, some research. Again, my name is Dave Ensley. My wife and I have been married 31 years. We have three amazing, beautiful daughters that we have raised. Um, I spent 30 years as a dedicated, passionate, and committed public servant. For 28 years, I was a police officer, and I retired a couple of about three years ago as the chief of police for the city of Klamath Falls. My wife and I own 5-H Cattle Company just outside Merrill, and we find great pride in what our, our brand represents and symbolizes in our community. After retirement, I decided I wasn't done. I needed, I needed to do something again and stay involved with my community, so I ran for Klamath County Commissioner, and I was elected. So I've served a term as Klamath County Commissioner, and in my role as Klamath County Commissioner, I was selected to be the co-chair of the Law Enforcement and Veterans Affairs Steering Committee for the Association of Oregon Counties, and I was selected to serve on the Agriculture and Rural Affairs Task Force for the National Association of Counties in Washington, D.C. And I fought really hard for our rural values. Um, again, if you look at my card, it lists out my priorities. They're agriculture, it's housing development, it's our economy, it's protecting things that are important to District 28. And I'm really excited to roll up my sleeves and continue to do that work for you. Keep in mind, this is an open seat. I'm not running against an incumbent. So this is a really great opportunity for me to run in an open seat and take my voice to Salem. I'm a dedicated, passionate, committed public servant, like I told you. And I think that my resume is very outstanding. And it shows that I've got the, back, the backbone and the background to go to Salem. Um, I encourage you to, to look at the candidates, and I encourage you to look at who's got a proven track record of positive results for people and for communities, and I think that that stands out. God bless you all. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. We're going to move around the corner here. Now, there are your two candidates for Senate District 28. We have two, uh, three levies actually coming up on the ballot, the uh, Ben Pine School District levy, and then there are two levies coming from our uh, folks from the Lapine Fire Department. So we'll give Shirley her two minutes, and then if our two fire department gentlemen would come on up, we'll have them speak. Thank you, Ann. Hi, I'm happy to be here, and in case you don't know, I represent South Deschutes County and Lapine, uh, up to Sun River, on the Ben Lapine School Board. Um, I, this is my third year. Uh, I've got one more to go, and then I have to make a big decision. But let me just alert you to the reason that we are putting on the ballot a local levy. It is not to build anything. That's a bond. And as you know, we, we did that a couple years ago. But the local levy is to fill the gap between what we are doing right now and what the legislature has promised us for the next two years. It's low. It is the lowest it's ever been um, in terms of percentages uh, for the biennium. So um, on the table there are some little flyers, but we have identified specifically six areas where we are going to put our money. And I want to assure you that we actually have split out in our budget just the local levy um, um, details, if you will, so that it, we will be very accountable for actually spending that money on these six things. Um, I know there's a lot of questions about what does it mean to have a dollar for assessed value. I want to remind you that assessed value, value of your property is not retail value. So the assessed value that, a value that actually shows on your tax statement is what would be um, used to uh, gather that $1 per thousand. 
Uh, we figure it's about, on the average, 67 cents a day. So um, we are concerned about local school positions, and that includes all of the blank schools. And we are concerned about programs. And we want to improve um, career and technical ed, uh, in particular, and um, keep class sizes where they are now, or better. Uh, and again, we just need this money to close that gap. Uh, if you also would like to help us, we are uh, working with the legislature to uh, wake up and say, we're not funding Oregon schools the way they should be. So, thank you. By the way, I can say, please vote yes. The school district staff cannot tell you how to vote, but I can tell you how to vote, and we need your votes. So, thank you very much. Shirley didn't uh, introduce herself completely. She is on the Ben Lapine School District Board of Directors and uh, representing South County. And we have Chief uh, Fire Chief uh, Eric Olsey and uh, Assistant Fire Chief Dan Doherty. There, been, there are two levies coming up, and they're going to explain about uh, each one. Hi, everybody. My name's Eric. Uh, first off, I just would like to, to thank the staff here. They put on a wonderful lunch. I don't know if they've got to hear appreciation from all of us, but thank you. That was wonderful. It's this cl collaboration between all these parts of the community. <laughs> Right, that, that allows us to bring these functions like this and allows us to, to address you. Um, I'm lucky to be here with uh, Assistant Chief Dan Doherty, and then also I have two directors here in support of our fire district levies. Uh, Director Lesueur is back there, and Director Vitsky. Uh, please say hi to them. They like the public, uh, you know, to mingle there. So, uh, anyway, uh, I, uh, we're here to talk about the, the measures here. I'm going to pass that off to Chief Doherty since he uh, produced our last message, just so I don't say something stupid. And uh, we're here to answer any questions that we have afterwards. And also, uh, we're having an open house on May 11th. If you have an opportunity to stop by, uh, we'll have food there. We'll have stuff for the kids. Uh, it's also in conjunction with the Public Safety Health Fair uh, through Oregon State Fire Marshal. So there's lots of things to help bring some of that fire prevention right back into your home. Uh, this has been a wonderful community. For those of you who don't know that I am kind of new to the fire chief position here to have been in and to engage the citizens here, and I've been having a wonderful time over the past uh, 10 months. Um, so it's just, it's been absolutely fascinating to see what you guys have done for fire prevention. I, I couldn't have really been more proud of the community in that realm. Anyway, I'll, I'll turn it over to Chief Doherty. Well, thank you. Um, I uh, have two uh, measures to introduce to you, um, and I want to emphasize that these two measures, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about them, uh, but these are renewals. These are existing levies and the rate in which we are asking uh, uh, remains the same. So uh, the emphasis is is renewal at the same rate. So um, we're not asking for any more. We're just asking for the status quo based on what you're currently paying uh, presently. So uh, just give you an overview of the district to understand what our challenges are and why we are asking uh, for this funding. Uh, we are um, uh, a uh, uh, standalone uh, fire district, an independent district. We have five board of directors that represent you as a community, and I would uh, encourage you to make sure that you're going to those folks and letting them know what you feel like we need in the community to serve you, because ultimately that's what we're here for. So um, we are we run about 3,000 calls a, a year, um, and uh, we have about 100 square miles of fire district that we cover and about 800 square miles of just medical response area. So our response area is relatively large at this point in time. So um, our challenges uh, that we have, that we experience every day, and what we're con continually up against are two different uh, unique challenges, or actually challenges that we're all facing in the fire industry right now, is A, uh, funding to be able to provide for the level of service that we want to provide our community. And then the second piece is keeping up with the rate of growth that we have in this community uh, and those areas in which we serve. So those are our unique challenges that we are constantly facing uh, and trying to keep up with. <clears throat> so to, to touch base on uh, the, the levies real quickly, um, we have two measures. Uh, I have some handouts we'll share. We have uh, measure 9165. It's a renewal of a five-year uh, operations levy. So think about uh, people and materials in order to support 
us to get the job done. And again, that's a five-year um, levy um, for just primarily operations. And I've got a list of things on our brochure as well. Make sure you get that, take a look at that. It's a little bit more specific of what we're asking for and why. Uh, the second one is 9166, and that is a 10-year capital levy. And so when we're thinking capital, we're thinking equipment, i.e. apparatus, uh, air pack, um, uh, air uh, monitors, uh, light pack monitors, and the things uh, that are required for us to provide service, as well as the facilities, in which most of our facilities are relatively old and they were never, uh, they were never designed to house people. And so we are uh, continuing to try to grow in older, in older buildings. And so uh, those continue to uh, create uh, maintenance issues and challenges for us as well. So again, uh, that's our capital-based uh, equipment uh, and facility. Uh, Chief and I will be around after the meeting. We will answer any questions that we uh, can provide for you. Uh, again, thank you for allowing us to come in front of you today. Uh, and uh, we wish you a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you to Chief Halsey. I was going to uh, express my thanks to the Senior Sa uh, Lapine Activity Center. <laughs> well, I'll get it. <laughs> Early I will. Uh, and uh, for the fabulous lunch, when, when I contacted Jamie and we started putting this together and she sent me the menu, I thought, wow. I picked a good day, didn't I? So it was a terrific lunch, and we thank Jamie and her crew and all the volunteers. Uh, they did a terrific job. Yeah. Okay. So now down to uh, some brass tackets. We we have a, a question. This was a, this is has many layers. <laughs> I'm not sure where this is gonna go, but this will be a question that I think all the candidates, the Deschutes County Commissioners and uh, Senate District 28 candidates uh, can answer because it's all concerning South County and uh, the issue, a big issue that is going on right now. So we're gonna try to keep it from going out into the weeds. And I, uh, I talked with a, a, a friend this morning that I consider an expert on this subject. She'll shake her head no, but I, I wanted to try to drill down. We, uh, we, we know we have a groundwater issue. We know we have uh, septic issues. We know that we've, uh, we've added camping. Uh, people are able to bring in RVs and have them on their pieces of property. We know that there is camping. We know that, that um, so, uh, basically, I think what it came down to is uh, a couple of things. The cost of the ATT systems that our people are having to put in to, uh, to upgrade their systems. There are uh, tons of failing systems out there for various reasons. Either they're not maintained properly, even ATT systems are have been known to fail because they're not properly ma maintained. We probably have an education issue where we're, the uh, homeowners are not being properly educated. And then uh, there's the issue with houseless people camping in the woods and where is all of that that's coming from their RVs and uh, that, that are camping out in the woods. How are we gonna handle all this huge issue all at one time, money for the people that need it, protecting the groundwater, and uh, I'm gonna start with Judy. Yeah, good idea, Bob. You wanna, yeah, you should do this. Yeah, <laughs> put Dave on that. <laughs> okay, you get to go first. <laughs> So that is a really tough question because there's like five questions in one when it comes to that. And, and I've got experience in every one of those issues and we're trying to, to deal with every one of those issues as a county commissioner in Klamath County right now, whether it be groundwater issues, homelessness issues, protection of our forest lands. So this can go a magnitude of ways. Let me, let me start with this. Building? building, you name it. We got all kinds of issues. No, you got way too much. <laughs> okay. 
So let's talk about groundwater issues for a minute. There's there's some real Okay, we're getting there. There's some real there's some real opportunities for us to enhance water quality and water quantity within the watersheds across all the state of Oregon, including Mapai, Jackson County, Douglas or Deschutes County, Jackson County. But we've got to start with looking at our forest lands. Right now, our forest lands are, are not being utilized properly at all. And I don't want to dive too deeply into that, but we're actually growing more trees than we're harvesting. And if we would actually have beneficial use of our natural resources, we would have much more opportunity for jobs, for economic growth, for prosperity, things like that. And we would unlock water out of our forests if we were managing them properly and there would be much more groundwater. So we've got a forest issue that's creating a groundwater issue. We've got some real opportunities to address homelessness with some funding and with some programs to help people get back on their feet, but there's got to be accountability by those people that participate in those programs. If they're not accountable to try to change that homelessness situation, it's going to be a failure. So I do support programs to support people to get back on their feet, but there has to be benchmarks and there has to be progress by that person and accountability by that person in, in that arena. And then we were talking about um, uh, are these uh, septic systems and things like that? We, we, we had a groundwater issue. It's Klamath County, but this is why it's relevant to Deschutes County as well. And we fought really hard with the state of Oregon to unlock $9 million to help us redo wells within Klamath County throughout the watershed because of, uh, of the issues we were having with water. So the state needs to continue to step in and look at ways to provide funding to local, um, um, local communities to fight whatever that issue is that, they're, that they're, uh, they're trying to address. And yours right now is a septic issue and a groundwater issue. And there's opportunities at the state level to fight for funding for those purposes, which I've proven time and time again I'm able to do and have done successfully. Perfect, thank you. Diane. So it's interesting when we have myriads of problems um, that, we, that we have to talk about. And I think a lot of this the reason why I'm running for state senate is to get to the root of the problem because I think what we're seeing is a lot of the, the leaves and the branches, if you will. We are subsidizing homelessness. We're allowing them by lawlessness to camp in the forest. If you or I, 10 years ago, hauled a camper out there, they would have come and said, look, after two weeks, you're not allowed to do this. Get off the land or move on. So we, we have a lot of lawlessness involved and I think, I think we need to um, stick with our law enforcement and say, you know, follow the law. I feel the same way about illegal immigration, right? So if, it, if we have the law, let's follow it. Legal immigration is fabulous. We all probably are, our, uh, our heritage is legal immigration. So we also, okay, so now when we move into the water issues, it's interesting again, to say, oh my goodness, our, our groundwater is depleted and they're blowing, they have blown the Klamath dams. We have been there for 30 years. We were in the water wars originally. We have fought and fought and fought to keep those dams in. What happens when you keep dams in and you have reservoirs? That water seeps down into the water table and you recharge your water table. What happens when you blow the dams and then cry, oh my goodness, our water table's depleted and blowing the dams forced everyone to drill wells, which compounded the problem as well. Now those wells are going dry, now we run to the state, which if, if, the, if they're gonna implement that policy, not according to my wishes, but you know, according to the majority party, if they're gonna implement policies like blow the dams, then we do have to come back behind and fund it. But, but I think it's a problem at its root. We have to continue arguing for common sense and and sustainable solutions, not just chasing after um, a problem, fixing it, patching it up, and then the next thing pops up that we've gotta go fix and patch up. I believe we should you know, go for the, the solution that will be long lasting, provide for our families and our futures. We have to have agriculture or we're going to be importing our food. Same with our forests, we have to get in there and and work the forests and cut the logs and use the timber for our housing needs. So it's not as complicated as the state and the bureaucracy creates. So they do create a lot of complications and a lot of administrative state issues that cost the taxpayers money. I think I'm all for 
private enterprise uh, solutions to these problems. I think America was built on private enterprise and great thinking individuals who could come up with solutions that the government cannot even come close to matching. So uh, private enterprise is the Thank way you. to go. Thank you, Diane. I didn't tell you, you have like, you know, three, four minutes. This is not as quite as good. But you did good. You said 34 minutes? Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh -uh. <laughs> uh, Just notate it's high noon. That means something in the world of Westerns, because I used to watch a lot with my dad. Uh, okay, so let's talk about a couple things. First of all, specific to South County, the, the groundwater issue, a lot of the wells that are drilled in South County are drilled at, they're, they're, in surf, they're a surface water well, they're not really a groundwater well, they're not drilled down to the aquifer. So there's a lot of wells in South County that are, yeah, I know of a couple that are 45 and 50 feet. That is not where our aquifer sits. So until we drill down to those levels, you're not going to have a consistent, sustainable level of water. Now, water, as much as I'd love to talk about it, water management is not under the purview of a county commissioner. Timber, as much as I love to talk about timber and how juniper abatement would solve some of our water issues and the connections between them, we don't handle forest management. 80% of Deschutes County is public lands. So as a county commissioner, it's our responsibility to go back to the state and federal agencies and demand that they perform in our county and that they protect all the citizens of Deschutes County. Uh, with regards to uh, specifically the, the septic issue and the water quality issue, um, I know a number of people who have had their water tested and it's perfect. However, the DEQ came out and released a report that, that there was uh, trace amounts of uh, nitrates and, and that all of a sudden, they're starting to raise some alarming flags, and everybody's like, we got to do something about it. They've tested their wells, their water's perfect. So part of the discussion that has to happen is I think we have been prone to hearing fear tactics all the time to drive our decision-making process instead of a more pragmatic, common sense, sit down and say, hey, if there's a problem, let's fix it. It's kind of the vanilla ice song. You know, if you got a problem, you all solve it. So I'm just saying, we need to have conversations that are honest, right? They're honest. They're built in transparency. That's what seems to be missing and lacking in our government. And I think that's what people, what, what I've heard is that it resonates with people. For the most part, people just want to be left alone. I want to live my life. I want to follow my pursuit of, of happiness and, and life and liberty. And you know what? The government has its role. It's a, it, it, it's a good role. Um, it probably should be more limited in its scope, if you ask most people. But I think that we could find a, a really efficient way to govern and address the needs of every corner of the Shoots County and not just specific municipalities. So let's talk about homelessness for a second. I call it homeless tourism. Um, some of my opponents don't like that phraseology, but it is what it is. Anytime you can attract people to where you're coming because of policies like Measure 110 that allow drug use, uh, unchallenged and you have people that are coming from out of state or other parts of the state to come do what they want to do and maybe make meth in a bathtub in Redmond and they don't see anything wrong with it. They're just entrepreneurs. That's, that's the perception. So you have to correct the thinking, okay? Homelessness is not something that causes drug addiction and mental health. Drug addiction and mental health typically are what lead to homelessness. So if you get those flipped, that's where we have to correct some of that. What I will tell you is that as a county commissioner, one of the things that I'm going to try to propose is meeting with each of the cities and municipalities to create a ring around the UGP that does not allow camping unless it's in an approved campground. That gives room for the managed housing projects that we're, or managed camping projects that we're looking at. But what it does is it forces people who want to squat on the land to go further out and no longer convenient. And then we have to cut off the spigot of free funding to just fund their lifestyle because they love the freebies. So that's what I intend to do as your Deschutes County Commissioner. Thank you, Ron. Go ahead. <laughs> Anytime. Well, that's a lot. Groundwater. Groundwater, of course, is unique here in, in La Pine, unique to many areas in Deschutes County. Um, I raise my family over we go down to our well depths over there are, are uh, 50 feet. We had 60 gallons a minute. It was actually into 
the aquifer. Okay, you go over to Ben. There's uh, there's no problem with groundwater over there either. The well depths are deeper, and they got to go sometimes three, four hundred feet or more just to get drinking water. Okay, then you come down to La Pine, and as Rob mentioned, anything that you know, uh, well depths are really shallow, and that's because you're into surface water. Surface water also affects. The ability to have a septic system that works. I know this, I've been involved in it. I've got a construction background, 30 years, real estate also. So I, I know what's going on with these things and I know what it, you have to go through to get a building permit and what the cost of those have gone skyrocketing. And first time home buyers have to finance fees for 15 to 30 years. And a lot of times that just prices them out of the market. And with rentals, rentals have gone sky high. In some cases, um, it's, well, in many cases, it's even cheaper to rent a place than it is to, to build one. So, that's a problem. I think that new systems that are engineered ways of finding out how do we process septic? How do we, what do we deal with that? Well, there are new and innovative ways to, to do that. There are pressurized systems, and sand, sand filtration systems, a lot of things that have been used over the years. So I think we need to keep working with that. But it's also unique to a pine and it's unique to sisters or wherever else you're at in Deschutes County. And our water, the water that we get naturally off of the, off the mountain, um, I don't think that piping, piping water is, is secure. Because what happens is things change, get changed. Fremont Canyon, uh, down and over near Sisters. That water used to run freely down through there from what is called White's Creek. Now, it's all piped in. That place is dried up. There used to be elk deer and everything else going down through there. Homeless issues. Look at Grand Pass. The government wants to come in there and they want to take over. And, they, and the Supreme Court is now going to decide what Grand Pass can do about the homeless situation. That's not right. We need to leave it to local people. We need to give them the right and not infringe on that right. I think we'll wrap that up. Thank you. <laughs> we could go on forever. <laughs> I took my opportunity to step in. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, Commissioner Shane. Um, let me first start by saying I'm a natural resources professional. I've been working in this community for 20 years to keep our drinking water clean, help people share, I'm, I'm getting to La Pine, trust me. Help, help people share our limited water supplies and stress them further, and uh, to get hazardous fuels reduction work done in our federal forest lands, like the La Pine project that the BLM implemented that helped to stop the Roslyn Road fire before it burned into subdivisions in 2020. I helped to plan those fires. Um, and plus you have a lot of parts. I'm gonna focus on water. I'm gonna start with groundwater quality first. So just so everyone understands, we have known for over 15 years that uh, we have unhealthy concentrations of nitrate in our shallow groundwater. And that is percolating farther and farther into the ground every year. And I will, in the next five, 10, 15 years, reach the intakes of thousands of people's domestic wells in South County. So what do we do about that? We need to, we need to, we need to stop putting so many nitrates into the ground. Um, some of the things we're doing are helping, uh, but we're not, we're not doing enough of them yet. And I'll, I'll just tell you about some of those things. Um, the county and the state are cautious. 
sharing with people to install new ATP systems. They're only 70% effective at removing nitrates, the, the, the model that people are using right now. So, you know, it's not like you're removing all of the nitrates that when, and when effluent comes out of a working septic system. And there's a lot of septic systems out there that still haven't been retrofitted up with ATP systems. Um, and you're in La Plain. Hundreds of the homes that are being built in South County are being built here in an incorporated city with access to a sewer system that fully treats those nitrates before that water is um, spread on, on the ground um, and is grown trees. So we need, we need more homes on sewer. Um, we've also, it's a very small number, but we have denied uh, that, that the county has the land use have denied um, some applications for properties that are extremely shallow groundwater properties. You know, a handful, maybe like three a year or something like that. But it, it helps. All those things are helpful. They're not enough. We are going to hear from the DEQ, the Department of Environmental Quality, in the next couple months, the results of their five-year monitoring report. Their most recent five-year monitoring report that says, um, the nitrates are still there, they're penetrating farther into the ground, getting closer to people's well heads. So we need to do, we need to keep doing those things, we need to do more of those things, and we need to do additional things. Uh, a couple of things that we can be doing are number one, uh, there are ATT septic systems that are even more effective at removing nitrates uh, than the ones that uh, you know we, we are currently allowed to use in this area. Like more like 95% effective versus 70% effective. They are more expensive. So how are you going to pay for that? Um, let, let me just talk about one of the other solutions and then we'll talk about how to pay for the other things. Um, we can pick some of the densest neighborhoods in South County um, in these uh, problem uh, groundwater areas and we could connect them to a sewer system, a central sewer system. That's a land use issue. Uh, we need to get a special exemption from the State Department of Land Conservation and Development to be able to move forward with those, with those solutions. Um, and, and that's really expensive too. The good news is that right now, um, there is a lot of funding available from the federal government from the bipartisan infrastructure law passed in 2021 for water and wastewater systems. So if we can get our act together and agree that something needs to be done and move those projects forward now, we could nab some of those federal funds. Is that the end of my time? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can talk all day about, sh about, about uh, water quantity as well, but that's a little bit on Well, I appreciate it. I know we asked a, a monstrous question. And, uh, <laughs> so, Bill does know a lot about this issue, and I appreciate that. Um, 20 years ago, the DEQ came in and said, you guys have to upgrade all of your systems, and you're going to have to pay for it. I am not a huge fan of DEQ. Um, I think they are going to be very busy down in the Klamath Basin fixing the natural disaster they have created by emptying those reservoirs and trying to blow up those dams. So I don't know that the nitrate issue in South County should be on their top priority. I think they really need to get down there and figure out how to stop killing a million fish and having deer herds sink in the mud and die. And it's just a horrible thing that they've done down there, the state of Oregon and the state of California. So 20 years ago, they came in and said, we need to fix all the systems. 275 have been done so far. 7,000 need to be done. They can cost upwards of $40,000, which I don't know if you guys have $40,000 sitting around in your bank account. But overall, it's going to cost over $200 million to fix all of these systems. So until DEQ can come in, sit down, and figure out how to pay for it, I think they should spend their time in the Klamath Basin fixing what they screwed up down there. So you can tell I'm a little uh, upset about that. You remember Dennis Luke came down and told all you guys, we're doing this and that's it. Whether you like it or not, we're doing this to you. 
That's why Tony DeBone's in office today. So that said, the homeless situation is untenable for the neighboring property owners. It's not health and safe, it's not safe for the people who are camping out there. It's a health and safety issue. Somebody just got shot on China Hat. They held a woman and her daughter hostage, one of the guys with a hatchet, and her husband had to go save her. I mean, so these are serious consequences. It's a health and safety issue. The county cannot um, implement codes on land they don't own or lease. So we need to have to figure out how to get that into the county's hands. Then we can create the codes to keep them off the property, which we definitely need to do. We need places for people to go. Martin versus Boise is a misinterpreted law. It says that there has to be beds available before you can remove people from land. But it didn't say it had beds had to be available for every person so that the Supreme Court is gonna take care of that. I'm sure they'll see the error of that way. And I want you to know that I do want to know what issues you face. I know you face a lot of them for me. The um, well issues are going to be a problem. The septic issues are going to be a problem because they are going to come in and say, you have a nitrate problem and you have to fix it. When they have 22 million cubic yards of heavy metals and sediment going down the Klamath River. I think they should concentrate on that. That's what I think. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. Okay, I'm gonna open it up to questions out here in the audience. Uh, I suspect we have created maybe several. Uh, I'm gonna start here with Rex since he's the first one that raised his hand. This is a question for our senatorial candidates. Denise and Dave. Lapine is a growing community, but there are communities around Lapine that are, are smaller, and um, I really want to talk about the DNB. Here in Lapine, we have over 25,000 people in this community who would love to have a DNB. We have a one-day-a-week DNB, and in the last 20 years, we've managed, through quite a bit of work on it, to get 45 minutes more a day from our legislature for the DNB. Now there's 25,000 plus people in this community. Lakeview, Lake County, has 7,500 people. They have a full-time DNB. Burns, Harney County, about 7,500 people. They have a full-time DNB. Um, Wheeler County, 7,500 people. I think they have less, they're only like 7,100 people. They have a full-time DNB. And for the last eight years, I have been, eight years, 10 years, 12 years, it's been a long time I've been, work, I've been working on this DMV thing. <laughs> Nothing has happened for the DMV in this community. Uh, Warner Rushke, our, our house rep, did get us that 45 minutes. <laughs> 45 minutes, folks, 45 minutes a week. That's, think about that. And when, if you were by there this morning, the line is out the door and down the, down the road. What can you, as a candidate, tell to this community that you will do to get a s essential state service to this community at a level that is appropriate for the size of the community and the need? Thank you. Yeah, so for eight years I've been working with Rex and the DMV situation and with Rep Reshke, um, because it has been an issue and we hear from a lot of folks here in Lapine. I think as, as Rex mentioned, you know, the, the, the details are, he's mentioning all the counties that have a DMV. Deschutes County has a DMV. So I'm not saying it's easy for you folks to drive the 20 miles to the DMV in Deschutes round trip, I know I drive 45 miles one way to get to our DMV. Yes. I'm sorry? Yeah. Well, 
and I, you know, I, I intervened with the DMV. We have liaisons, legislative liaisons that work with our offices for the agencies. But the agencies are the ones setting the rules and you can bark and bark and bark and you can get 45 minutes, but it takes, they will say they don't have the manpower, they don't have the budget, they don't have um, the resources to provide more. So as much as I would love to say, yes, absolutely, we're gonna get you guys a full-time DMV, it's not a possibility for a state senator. Dave can't do it, Senator Lipicum can't do it, Rep Reschke can't do it. Um, we can work for it, absolutely. We can continue arguing for it, we can continue lobbying for it, um, but it's, it's out of our purview to demand that system. So, you know, we'll, we do all we can for our communities um, to improve the lives and um, your ease of living, but at the same time, we all, we all have to come to the realization that we did choose to live where we live. I live on ranch land in Klamath County, and I'm 45 minutes from the, from the DMV. Sir, yeah. sir, excuse me. So, um, finish. And it's an inconvenience. I have to go over a snowy pass to get to town, but I have to live with the decision that I made to live there. I enjoy the peace and quiet. Um, so uh, we appreciate what you folks here in Lapine are, you know, when you have issues that you're dealing with. I've worked with lots of people here in Lapine, lots of uh, constituents, and, um, and I've solved a lot of problems. There's, you know, there's multiple agencies at the Capitol. There's Oregon Employment Department has had a big fiasco that I've worked with probably hundreds of constituents throughout the district um, dealing with the unemployment issues because they put in a new system and it didn't really work very well. People were two months late getting their checks. So we're able to intervene with those kinds of things and get that fixed up and get the help that people need. Um, so, you know, we've got from the DMV to DHS, which is Department of Health and Human Services, um, issues with, with child care, education, all those things. So my, my advocacy is, um, you know, for communities to, you know, can, I love hearing from you guys at the office and I will continue to do all I can to serve the needs of Lapine and the rest of the district. Um, and we will continue marching forward. You know, government is, is a big barge and it moves slowly. And so we just have to keep at it and keep trying and Rex is tireless um, and he's, he's a great advocate and I enjoy uh, uh, his emails to me and, and uh, putting a, a little fire under there and, and we get going on that. So, appreciate it. So let's be honest, I'm not gonna make a campaign promise I can't keep, so I don't know if I'm gonna get you more time, but this is what I am thinking. Many, many years ago, I was at the FBI National Academy, and we heard a presenter, he was the helicopter pilot that was flying the Black Hawk um, that was shot down, and it was his story about survival. And one of the things he said has stuck with me for many, many years, and he said, don't tell me we can't, tell me how we can. And I think about that all the time. Tell me how we can, tell me how we can. No isn't just the answer all the time. Now, do I think we'll get more than 45 minutes? I don't know, but let's fight. Let's find out. If, if Rep Reschke got you 45 more minutes, then what, what else can we squeeze out of that turnip? Let's, let's find out. But I think it's worth fighting for. One of the things I said to you when I started, when I gave my introduction was, this is not my seat, it's yours. You get an opportunity to put somebody in that position that will fight for you, that aligns with your principles and your values and your belief systems. And I've got a proven track record time and time again that I fought for my community and I fought for people and supported people. And I think that that says a lot. It's really, it's really easy to do your research and look back to see what people's accomplishments are and see if those align with you. But I can't wait to be your Senator Rex. I can't wait for you to call and tell me, Dave, we got a serious problem. I can't wait for me to say, Rex, when are you gonna be in Salem? Let's go rattle some doors. Let's find out what the solution is. Now, do I think I can do it? I don't, I don't know. I'm not gonna promise you I'm gonna get you a DMV. That would be foolish for me to say. But for 30 years as a public servant, I have fought for the needs 
and the expectation of the people in the communities I serve. When I was the chief of police, I established a community police advisory team, and I met with the community all the time to ask them, what do you want from me? We were the top 10 worst place to live in, in Klamath Falls when I got hired as a chief of police. By the fourth year I was there, we were ranked the 15th safest place to live. And that was because that's what the people wanted and demanded of me. That's my duty to serve as a public servant. So I will fight for you, I will protect you, and I will stand by your values. Thank you. Be careful what you ask for. Ask Tim Rex to put on the boxing gloves and fuck with you. That could be very interesting. We have a question here. Um, I'm a little tired of general, general outreach. I would like some more specifics. I would like to ask Phil Chang about um, the connection between homelessness and housing. And the housing, I believe everyone deserves a roof over their head. So what what is being done currently about housing in Mr. Cruz County? And, and if all the commissioner candidates will get to answer this one, right? Yes. But thank you for thank you for letting me speak first. Um, housing and homelessness are connected, and they're also discrete things. First on homelessness, uh, I want to point out to everyone that uh, we just completed a point in time count in January for uh, for the tri county region. The only places in the three county region where homelessness went down, Ben and Red. Why did homelessness decrease in those places? Those are the places, and, and the bed count includes Chang Hat Road and, and Dirt World North Juniper Ridge. Uh, so numbers went down. Why did numbers go down? Because in those places, they are giving people who want to exit homelessness a safe place to lay their head, safe parking, congregate shelters, uh, tiny house villages. And they are providing those people with both services and accountability uh, to get them on their way on the pathway out of homelessness. So you invest, you invest in those services and those places for people to safely sleep. Uh, and what happens? They exit homelessness. Go figure. Um, that's what we need to be doing every but uh, there are, uh, you know, to get to the housing, there are a lot of people in our community who uh, sleep in a car every night or an RV because they can't afford rent. Um, you, know, you, you don't necessarily recognize them when they're standing behind you in the grocery line at the, at the store. You, you, you may see their clothes are a little shabby, but they were clean. They went to work that morning. Um, they can't afford places to rent. So, what we need is more affordable housing projects, like literally pro some of the housing projects that are a stone's throw from here. Putney Place, a couple blocks over there, built by Habitat for Humanity, Little Deschutes Lodge, right here, um, built, for, built for seniors uh, by Pacific Crest Affordable Housing. Um, Pacific Crest Affordable Housing, the principal, John Gilbert, by the way, is one of my endorsers. So how do we get affordable housing? Housing is really expensive to create. Land is expensive, um, construction materials and labor is expensive, infrastructure to connect your housing to the city is expensive or the community. And so to get housing that's affordable, we need to help buy down the costs of that housing. And one of the ways that the county has helped to buy down the cost of, of housing to put it within reach of working people is by contributing land or uh, offering land at discounted prices that the county owns. Here in Lapine, we own hundreds of acres, um, and we have been deploying that. Both of those projects I mentioned, county land domain. Um, right down the street on Huntington, there's a, we sold at a very discounted price a few acres to Housing Works and uh, Rooted Homes Land Trust. So they can, they can do a mix of rental units and affordable home ownership opportunities right next to each other so that people can move from one to the other when they're ready. So there's a little bit about uh, housing and homelessness. Thank you. I know it's hard to keep to uh, a timeline. Let's uh, go this way and then we'll go that way. Thank you for the question. Um, 
Housing is obviously a problem in all of Central Oregon. One of the things that I found um, is upsetting to me is elected officials and city councils say, we need to build more housing, we need to build affordable housing, we need to build workforce housing. But all I see going up are $800,000 homes in Bend, $400,000 homes in La Pine, and no one can afford to buy those homes. And so I appreciate the question. The homeless count did go up 10% under this county commission. And so it did go down in little places, but it, it did go up, in fact. We, the county does own hundreds of pieces of land. And what the county needs to do is donate that land or give it at a discount in order to build workforce and affordable housing. I actually was on the committee for the catalyst to build an affordable 40 unit affordable housing project in Deschutes County. It can be done. You need people in there who know how to get it done and get it done quickly because all we're doing is expanding and we're not helping the people in the community. Over the last five years, I've taken in three homeless people, two homeless cats and a homeless dog. They've all left and gotten their stuff together, gotten jobs, found places to live. So I think as communities we can help, but I think as government, as the county, we definitely need to step up and do more and require that it be for people who are really low income and not four, five, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollar homes. Thank you, Judy. I'm in favor helping the homeless and helping them find jobs, be able to meet their basic needs in all areas of Deschutes County. I'm not in favor of <clears throat> individuals that move whatever they have on properties, move them in and live next to someone one and put fear in their hearts, trash the areas. I'm not in favor of persons that move in and are really, in some people's opinion, including mine, not homeless. They, they have their camper, they have their tent, and they will move it into areas and then just leave it there and they will be ha they'll have to be removed. That's not right. I believe that there are a number of temporary housing facilities available in our town, shelters, and a lot of times, even given the opportunity to move into those shelters, uh, they don't want to. And you cannot help someone unless they want to be helped. And I'm all in favor of helping someone in need and, and also that if the county can provide ways and means to do that and help them and then have programs where they can get themselves out of homelessness. And I'm all for that situation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Rob? Uh, okay, so you can't, I mean, the, the housing issue is definitely separate than the, from the homeless issue. Um, so you kind of have to address both of them, but there is some interconnectedness. Um, there's a difference between temporary sheltering and housing. And um, I, for one, I mean, if I could get a free house to go homeless, uh, I know people that would be tempted to do that. So the reality is the shelter is designed to be a stopgap to get people out of homelessness. So we have to start with being compassionate towards those who are in homelessness and don't want to be. And they want help. How do we help them? Well, there's a lot of services. Our, our, our health department is the, the largest department in the county. So what are we doing as a health department to address those issues and try to ramp up the recovery? Um, but if someone doesn't want to be, they want to be homeless because they like the lifestyle, Giving them a house is not going to fix that problem. 
It's just going to make the homelessness move into a home. So we have to address that issue uh, separately. I disagree with the point in time count. I do not think it's an accurate number because it requires a certain number of people. It requires everybody's cooperation and not everybody who's camping on our grounds wants to cooperate. So I, I do think it's, it's not an accurate number. I also know that in the last three years since uh, Mr. Chang has been commissioner, our homeless count has doubled in our county. I'm not, I'm not attributing that to him. I would just say that he is part of the leadership and he hasn't obviously found a solution to it. So it's, it's, it's a multifaceted problem. One person doesn't get it done, but it requires a collaborative effort with everybody in the county, citizens and public servants, all working together and saying, how do we solve it? How do, can it be solved? Uh, the experts I talk to say, you can't solve homelessness. Um, I've got kids growing up that have never known Oregon and Central Oregon without homelessness. It's always been a part of their life. We remember that world, but they don't. So the big thing on, on that side of it is just we really have to be mindful of remaining compassionate, but finding and, and, and make, uh, we have to require things from people when they want to transition out. We have to have metrics. We have to have things to say, look, if you want to move to the next step, here's what's required of you. Um, if you want to move to the step beyond that, here's what's required of you. Uh, accountability is huge. Um, and it, it, giving free money, there's no accountability in it. And I don't know about you, but I can tell you myself, I'm tired of writing a blank check to enable rather than empower. So that's, that's the homeless issue. As far as housing goes, I do think the county has a tremendous amount of land that we sit on that's not developed. We have to be okay targeting specific tracts of land. I think the way, one of the ways that we can bring the cost down of housing is to, to use some of the trust uh, capabilities that you can. You could do some land trust. Um, it, it, obviously, you guys have an example down here in the pine. I think there's other areas around here. I think there's other, other areas in the county where we can address building. Everybody wants I don't care if it's a postage stamp. You want your own space, right? We don't get that when you build six-story apartment complexes, and and it, it just it's it's not what people want. What people want is they want. I don't care if it's you know ten square feet of grass. It's my grass, right? So that's what people want. So then, how do we bring the cost of building down? Because right now you can't build, you cannot build just materials. You can't. It's very very difficult to build for under about 150 to 170 dollars a square foot. So you look at every, if I'm gonna build a thousand square foot house and it costs me 170, the house itself is gonna cost me 170,000 bucks. What's the land cost? Well, you have the land trust comes in and says, hey, look, you know what? You don't own your land, but you own your house. That's similar to every manufactured home park that you see. Somebody else owns the land, but you own your house. It's your house. It's your yard. You're responsible for it. That's a good transitional way to get people moved into where they can then take the next step and say, hey, now I'm gonna own my land and my house. So that's, that's uh, and I would love to leverage my relationships with, with contractors and subcontractors and suppliers to try to drive that number of 170 even further down by doing both buys. I think we can do it as a county, it just requires collaboration from the private industry to create a solution to a public problem. Okay, I think uh, probably time for one more question and then we'll open it up to, boy, now everybody's got their hand up. Three, three more questions, go. Yeah. Hi, thank you guys for coming. Um, Rob, I really appreciate you emphasizing transparency um, because to me what's been happening over these last several months with the board, the commissions, is disgusting. The fact that the sex registrant issue up in, on Wilson Road, the only reason that that situation where the County was going to allow 40 to 50 sex registrants in a neighborhood across from a school. The only reason that got stopped was because the neighbors found out about it. That was hidden from them. It absolutely was. You can say it wasn't, but it was. Because there is no way that that neighborhood would have agreed to allow 40 to 50 sex registrants to come in. Now, I'm sorry. Okay, the question is, it's along with transparency, why should you and the rest of the group that allowed this to happen be allowed back into office? It was practically criminal to me, the fact that you would know what risk you put those families at, 
the fact that they would never be allowed to resell their homes because you have to disclose when sex registrants live there. The fact you, these known registrants and sex offenders were being brought into an area that put children at risk and you knew about it and you didn't allow it to become public. The only reason it stopped was because the neighborhood stood up and protested. You got to answer the first one. I'll answer this one first. So, I'm very familiar with that project. I've been in contact with multiple people who are first first-hand knowledge. They're the neighbors. They're the people that are, that are the most affected by having a registered sex offender home next to them. I will tell you that I believe very, very passionately that we have to protect our children first. And so anytime we do anything and put the children at risk, that's our future. So I, I, I just don't understand supporting the, the, the risk. I'm not saying that there is even necessarily another offense that will happen, but there's a risk of an offense. And to move that in next to schools, parks, and houses is ridiculous. Now that being said, what I'll tell you is that there was a House Bill 1530 that just came through the state legislature that gave funding to the same nonprofit that that bought that that was coordinating to, on the on the uh, management of that property and ultimately would get it. Now they don't require a grant to buy that same house, so now they can just pick a house and be like, we're going to buy that duplex right there. And what I'll tell you is that they have a they have a, a 30 day there, there's markers for when you have to report people staying at that house as a registered sex offender. And if you cycle them through quickly enough, then your neighbors never know that you have a duplex full of level two and three registered sex offenders. That's the transparency that really irks me because it's not present. And so we have to be honest. We have to be, how many times do you all of a sudden find out about something after and it's too late to do something? So this election really matters to us because this is a time for us actually to put someone in that has transparency, that has honesty, that has integrity, that isn't bought, that doesn't have to recuse themselves from different issues because of fundraising issues or because of a lack of experience. I am here to stand up and say, look, you guys matter. Sir, I know that you're super frustrated. I want to know who lives in the pie. Uh, tell me. Uh, up here? Up here? Yeah. Nobody. Nobody. But how many, of, how many of us have friends and family that live in the pine? Because you think, if you think I'm doing it, if you think I'm doing this, sir, if you think I'm doing this only for myself, let me, let me talk. please do. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what you think. The worst of all, uh, I agree. We all live here. We I don't, agree. We don't have any children to do. All we have is housing, housing, people from foreign lands. Everybody's coming in here. We have okay. nothing. You let, you let us have nothing in here. We have to have some furniture. So as, your, as a county commissioner, let me, let me ask you a question. As your county commissioner, how do I best represent your concerns as a, as a citizen of La Pine? You're terrible. You're full of shit. <laughs> That's not uh, although I appreciate your answer, I think that you're kind of misguided. Yeah. So you don't know me, right? And I don't know you, and that's okay. I don't want to know you. That's fine. I'm, I'm not asking you to know me. But whether you like me or you don't like me, it's still my responsibility as a county commissioner to do what's best for La Pine, to do what's best for Terrebonne. To do what's best for sisters, Redmond. I know, I understand that, but we don't live in a box. And it's a county. It's Deschutes County, right? So we have to be able to represent everybody, and that includes you. You know. Yeah. Well, I haven't had the opportunity yet. Okay. I appreciate it. I'll look into it. Well, pass All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. I believe that the public needs to know. The people that live in a neighborhood need to be the first ones to know what is proposed in their neighborhood. Whatever it is. That use was a conditional use. And it had to be approved, it had to be presented to the public, gone through all the vetting of what would be who would be living there? And where are they next to? They're, they're next to schools. They're next to moms and dads, children. There's a lot of things there that need to be considered. And if they're not, and it's, it's 
swept under the rug until the vote occurs, then that is wrong. It's a tragedy. It's a mistake. It's not for the benefit of the constituents. And I, I will continue on with that, what Rob said about being in a situation where because of campaign funds or special interests, you wind up recusing yourself and not taking the vote. If you don't take your vote, you're not representing one third of the vote. And that includes Lapine. Especially the pine at the moment. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mr. Hammond. Let me give you a little background on this uh, this project. So the title, the name of this project, this program was uh, Justice Involved Individual Transitional Housing Project. Here's the here's the here's the here's the issue. County does not release people from jail. Judges do. And judges release people with jail, from jail with certain criminal records every day in our community. If those people do not have a place to land, they will become homeless. And you think somebody who has uh, you know, sex offenses in their criminal record who's homeless has a good chance of not reoffending, even if it's not a sex offense, you know, some other thing, right? It's pretty hard. It's pretty hard for someone who gets out of jail and has no place to go uh, to stay straight. That's why this project was created. Our community justice department told us, our parole and probation officers told us, we've got people who are being released on supervision they can't find a place to stay. They are disappearing. We can't supervise it. Do you think someone who's released <coughs> from prison on probation or parole, who parole and probation officer can't find them, is more or less likely to reoffend? That's why we needed this transitional housing project. So go from there. It's a it's a needed project. Then you ask. Are there risks associated with that? Yeah, of course. there are risks associated with, with this population. What can we do about that? Number one, this transitional house concept uh, gives them a place to go where there's a 24-7 manager keeping an eye on them. That's number one. Number two, uh, it is a place where their parole officer can find them and can work meet with them every week. There's a parole off there would be a parole project got canceled, so it, this won't happen, but there would be parole officers in that house on a daily basis checking in with parolees. That's two. Number three, after we heard concerns from neighbors about, you know, who are you going to be putting in there? You're going to be you're going to be putting people in there with level two sex offenses, level three sex offenses. Like, that's not safe. We said, Let's develop a screening tool at our parole and probation, adult parole and probation department to screen people. Uh, we can we, we have all sorts of primogenic predictive factors that we can run people through, and we will not put people in that house that have a high risk of reoffending. So we put all those things in place. Um, it was not satisfying to the neighbors. They didn't want they didn't want this in their neighborhood. Nobody wants but it is something that our community needs. I send my kid to the closest school to that house. And I felt comfortable doing that because I believe in our judges. I believe who sentence people. I believe in our corrections officers who work with these people while they're in jail. I believe in our parole and probation officers who would be supervised. I, the, the, one, the one other thing I'll say about this, the one other, so this, 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 this organization, Free on the Outside, was mentioned. So just to be clear, Free on the Outside has run programs like this all over the state for 15 years. They have run
run over 900 people with these kinds of offenses in their record through their transitional houses. Of those 900 people, there was one case of reoffense, a, a public indecency offense. Um, that's less than a 1% uh, reoffense rate uh, while people were in this transition. I'm retired for 25 years. Yeah, I'm sorry, you are done. You're done. Yeah, I'm sorry. You, you yeah, yeah, might I, have been. We are going to allow. Thank you. Thank you. Your Let it be a thing. Let it be a thing. So, um, Thank you for inviting me here today, and I try not to do the campaign rhetoric because I know you guys don't buy it. But this is the difference between me and everyone else standing up here. When I heard about this project, I went and testified against it two times. I contacted the leader who was getting it stopped. I told him how to work with the county commissioners to get this project um, killed so that it didn't happen. We spent a lot of time and effort, and that's the difference between me and Rob, who contacted the person. I jumped in and helped, and I helped to get it um, killed. So I just want you to know that's a different, I'm action-oriented, and I'm gonna help the people in this county and not just talk about it. Okay, well that was, uh, that was a loaded question. <laughs> Obviously. Uh, first off, I want to say thank you personally to all of you for taking time out of your uh, hugely busy schedules to uh, come do this. I know this is your job because uh, you're campaigning, but the people in the room I think appreciate it as well. Let's give them a big hand. This is, uh, you really buttonholed them. And uh, so now this is going to be your opportunity to go talk with everybody one-on-one. -on -one. Don't forget Shirley Olson here with the Ben Lapine School District. And uh, we have Rex still in the room that can answer questions about the fire district levies if you have questions there as well. Be kind. The, uh, these folks have come a long way and they are, uh, all of them, I think the overriding uh, factor for all of them is they're here to help us and help make better communities for all of us. So thank you, thank you to all of you, and uh, feel free to come on up and get some uh, yard signs and ask your questions. And I forgot to say, Jim, I'm so sorry. We have been, uh, we have been filming this, Connect Central Oregon. Jim Fister had, and his crew have been here. It's going to be on a, a YouTube video and if you are interested in having the link to that or knowing where it exists on YouTube, you can give me a call or shoot me an email at the chamber. It's director at lapine.org and I will give you the link to that and you can send it on to others. Oh, and it's gonna be posted on Facebook as well. So we'll give you access to that.